Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Derek Graham, the founder and CEO of Portal Asset Management. And today's expert will share insights regarding the disintermediation of the banking system and how the adoption of DeFi could create more liquidity. Portal Asset Management is an award-winning multi-strategy digital currency fund that targets to deliver investors with 25% per annum net of fees with monthly liquidity as per their website. And the digital fund has managed to outshine their own targets over the last two years up to April 31st this year alone. They provided their high value investors with 61.4% returns on investment. And today's discussion should be very inspiring as we aim to decipher how the new DeFi systems can be melded with the current monetary system. And Derek will share expert insights on the CBA pilot platform, digital payments, emerging into the mainstream via MasterCard and PayPal, onboarding with crypto. So bringing you live today, founder and CEO of Portal Asset Management, Mr. Derek Graham. Welcome to the show, Derek. Oh, delighted to be here, Sage. Thank you for inviting me on board. It's been a very busy week, hasn't it? With all this activity and CBA is just one of them. Absolutely. It's been full on and it's so exciting to watch it all happen. Great to have you back on the Expert Talks show. So, yes, CBA, let's start there. The pilot platform to hold cryptocurrencies okay. in Australia. <laughs> the same bank reportedly... So firstly... Go on. No, please let us know your insights. Okay, certainly. So, so with that thought of CBA, as you say, it's the same bank that was looking at debanking um, and was debanking regularly cryptocurrencies over the last, um, probably over the last 12 months. And it's been quite an extraordinary change to see the CBA going from uh, a debanking bank to one that's embracing this. And, and you know, that, that happens in this process, this rapid process of disintermediation. And, and I guess the question is, is why, right, Sage? Exactly. I, I've heard that uh, ridicule and even rebuttal is part of the integration process of a new idea, especially one that's theoretically sounding brilliant and great, but perhaps in real world practices hasn't had the chance yet to show its potential. But, but I'm interested to see if so it's, it's, the rumours about Visa jumping on the crypto bandwagon will also um, I don't very know, come to fruition. So what, what we believe we're seeing is the disintermediation of banking. And this disintermediation of banking means that only the giants will survive and they will have to adapt to be able to survive. So as you say, um, you know, Visa Card is, is noting that it's intending to join. We already know MasterCard is enabling the transaction in Bitcoin. PayPal is enabling the transaction in Bitcoin. And now we've seen CBA step out and say that they're prepared to, to essentially be custodians for digital assets. It's our view and also the view of the industry that a future of banking are going to be those of custodians. They will be keeping digital assets. One has to remember, Sage, that digital assets aren't just Bitcoin and currencies. They are digital representation of either digital assets or utilities um, or, or, um, or transaction uh, methodologies, or they could be digital assets of real world, as one calls it, or legacy world uh, technology, which could be real estate and cars and all sorts of things. Well, if you want to have assets and you want to be able to lend against them, the bank wants to hold them, right? So if the bank turns around and says, okay, show me your portfolio, and you can say, well, I've got this house and it's worth this amount of money, However, I've got half a million dollars of digital assets here and I've got this amount here in borrowings and I'd like to borrow some more. The bank now is going to be able to enable banking across its digital assets in a more traditional environment. My view is that's the reason why the CBA has come into this space because they see the future of both being custodians for digital assets and to be able to deal and lend against them. Right. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I did see something reported by Forecast News a couple of weeks back that mortgages were going to be allowed on the blockchain in Australia as well. So interesting to note the correlation there of now CBA emerging as one of the first banks to allow crypto on their platform. So the digital payment sector, Derek, is progressing rapidly with the onboarding of crypto by MasterCard and PayPal with Visa rumoured to be following. Will cryptocurrency see a change to the practices of international money transfers by the likes of Western Union and SWIFT? And will they still be relevant in the future? 
Well, that's a very big question. Um, <laughs> and so our view on that is that uh, is that SWIFT, which is interesting, so we all know SWIFT is the international transfer system. Um, many people might think it was called SWIFT because it was fast. But those of you that have used SWIFT realise that three days is not fast to transfer money. It actually stands for the Society of Worldwide Inter Internet Banking Financial Technologies. So they transact $5 trillion a day. So to give you an idea of what that is per annum, that's $1.25 quadrillion dollars per annum. It's a sort of term that I only hear in science fiction movies, really. And it's and their actual bank, the SWIFT network, is worth about $400 billion. But it really is a legacy system. And it's a system that if you were to explain to someone, let's say a Gen X, and you explain to them in 15 or 20 years time that we used to have this system where you put money in, they charged every bank that touched it along the way, charge you money, and it came to the other end maybe three days later, maybe, or it would bounce back, and it would they would charge you a large amount of money whether it got there or not. People would go, I don't believe that. And so now with the likes of, 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 of many digital assets, you can transfer a digital asset from one wallet to another wallet, um, possibly via an exchange if you have your, your um, assets in the exchange, and you can do that in 20 to 30 seconds. Sage, is it a difference? It's a huge difference. And so you'll see economies like the Philippines, which is so indebted to Western Union, who would take 8% or so out of every transaction of a maid that would be working in Switzerland, sorry, in Singapore, um, to send money back to their parents. Now they're able to send money back, and they do, using digital assets. And they do it at a very rapid rate, instantaneously, at a tiny cost. Um, we see tremendous disruption in this industry. And that disruption occurs across what we call the disintermediation of the banking system. The very large ones will adapt, like we're seeing the CBA doing. We understand NAB is not far away from announcing something similar. Um, and the very small ones, which we don't have a lot of in Australia, but if you look out through America where there's hundreds and hundreds of state banks, um, we don't see them as being able to compete in, in this future world of, of digital assets and high-speed transactions. It's amazing to see what blockchain is really allowing to happen. Um, and in comparison with what Western Union and SWIFT are charging, gas fees, for example, on the Ethereum blockchain got quite expensive this week as the hash rate increased. And it was apparently costing about $50 yes. a transfer in the times during high congestion. Do you think there's a way to work yes. out when the congestion will be less, or are there ideal times when you should be transferring uh, using crypto? So I've often said that this industry, as I said earlier, you know, it moves in dog years. It's moving so extraordinarily rapidly. We as human beings tend to take a snapshot at the time and go, this must be the future. And it's a snapshot in the transition of this technology. So what you're seeing with Ethereum is that it's expensive to transact on. But there are layer two technologies and roll up technologies. And these are these are parallel transaction technologies that aggregate many transactions and then they place them on to the Ethereum blockchain. Those layer two technologies and layer two solutions like Lightning Network, et cetera, um, are very efficient. And as they get adopted by more and more um, wallets, et cetera, out there, you'll see high speed and inexpensive transactions occurring but recorded on the likes of the Ethereum network. But at the same time, there's networks like Solana already, which is not as centralized, quite not quite as, as robust in its, um, in its storage and, and, and accounting processing because of its centralized aspect, but very inexp inexpensive to make transactions in. And you're seeing them becoming quite prominent now too. Yes, absolutely. Solana, Cardano, and I believe Polygon was made by Ethereum to help with um some of their uh, functionalities that weren't available on their um, main chain. So uh, Derek, just mm. off the main question, uh, main discussion quickly, um, security tokens may come into the spotlight now with the banks allowing um, uh, crypto exchanges on their platforms. Um, Polymath came into the spotlight earlier this week or last week when they said their mainnet Polymesh was being launched. Do you have any uh, insights to share on security tokens? Do you think they will be important as the banks come more into play with crypto? Oh, hugely important. Security tokens or, or tokens representing assets um, are going to, 
I think, disintermediate the way we see wealth owned around the world. We were just before this, I was doing a podcast, and the podcast was was with a gentleman in India, and India is adapting uh, to digital assets at an extraordinarily rapid rate because they're a very bright nation, a lot of software engineers, they are no money, etc. And so what we're seeing there is that, is that these guys, relatively low cost, are able to adapt and design technology and transact aspects all around the world. This disintermediation or democratization of assets is what you're going to see happening. And when that's happening, it's going to be happening against securities. And so as an example to that, um, one might own a hundred dollar share in, um, in the Sears Tower in Chicago. And that hundred dollar share might uh, return you 8% per annum. However, you could also own a hundred million dollars of that building, or you could own a dollar fifty worth of it. It would still return you the same amount per annum by ratio. And that could be owned not just by a wealthy um, in institution in the US, it could be owned by an Indian lady in a village in Ubud Pradesh. So this digitization of assets, real estate, stocks, um, and, and rolling assets, etc., uh, is an inevitability in our view. And when that does occur, of course, you'll actually see a lot of the silos that we're used to in this world, like the ASX is a silo. Unless you've got a broad, a, a Bloomberg network in the US, you're not going to trade on it when you're overseas. I think a lot of these silos will able to be opened up. And so ASX stocks, Iranian stocks, UK stocks, everything can be digitized, transacted and owned by anybody anywhere in the world. And that comes from the process of securitization. Wonderful. And I think uh, one of the other main factors with the security tokens was that they actually do um, maintain um, a record of people's names that people can't transact anonymously on Polymath, for example. But that, that just opens up a whole new world. And I think NFTs is a prime example of how that is actually proliferating yeah. um, and, and making a lot of liquidity for artists and, yes. and people getting involved in the community. So with the rapid growth of DeFi, are there signs this is the beginning of the disintermediation of the banking system globally, Derek? Yes. Well, I mean, CBA's announcement is the science age. And so we're already seeing it happen. Um, but what's intriguing is that we often get um, maybe a little bit overwhelmed about how much this space is evolving and changing and what are the activities and how do you ever keep track of it? And the fact of the matter is you can't. It's growing at such an ex exponential rate. Just value-wise, today it sits at $2.94 trillion in value. Um, and to give you an idea, that's about 38% of the value of gold um, in the world already. Um, and so what, you're, what people often forget is that this is all based on a blockchain. And a blockchain is a distributed ledger technology. It is a highly automated accounting system. The last accounting system that was created was created in the 1400s by the Benedictine monks, and it was called the double entry bookkeeping system. And our entire economies work on the double entry bookkeeping system. And if it wasn't for that, our economic system wouldn't operate. So you can see, Sage, when you replace that with a new accounting system, anything's possible. And so therefore, when you talk about the creation of non-fungible tokens and how the artists can engage directly with, um, with their, their customers, that is simply another method of an accounting system enabling, enabling the removal of these third-party institutions that validate double entry bookkeeping systems. Do you see what I mean there? When that occurs, the economy can grow enormously and the creativity of what's happening in this particular space is booming. That's why you're seeing the likes of Ethereum go to 4,700 US dollars as of today. Um, you're seeing these, these areas like Polkadot, Cardano, Avalanche, um, all growing because each one of those are blockchains. Each one of those are accounting systems and each one of those represents a virtual sovereign state, let's say, of an economy that builds. And those sovereign states then connect with each other through an, a process called interoperability. And so this is growing at a rate that's extraordinary. So for, for listeners that are, that are looking at this, don't be overwhelmed about it. 
just realize this is a glorified accounting system and what happened the last time an accounting system was created? Well, all around us happened the last time an accounting system was created. And, and this was just as much of a revolution, if not more, than the Benedictine monks double entry accounting system. Wow, how insightful. That's really uh, quite an interesting historical story there. It actually brings to mind uh, Shakespeare's character Shylock from The Merchant of Venice and he was a moneylender. And I mean, those uh, themes are still current now about the greed of people and things like that. And perhaps this system that we exist in is kind of promoting a bit of greed and, and the, the hungriness for wealth I mean, financial security is so important, but if there was a way to do it in a peer-to-peer -peer economy, which kind of evens yes. out the earnings and instead of it going straight to the top, um, it, it yes. will be interesting to see its effects. Well, I, I think those effects are, are playing through now. And, and if you look at a historical viewpoint, what happened in the process of, of the capitalism and the disintermediation of wealth was normally technology. And capitalism is an extraordinary system, but as you know now, it's not an overly effective system when the top 10% own 50% of the assets in, the, in countries like America. And there's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of anxiety and, 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 and aggression associated with, with um, this disproportionate wealth. That has happened be before many times in history and it's been broken down many times in history. So if you look at, say, the landed gentry of the United Kingdom, that landed gentry generated um, wealth from rent and the Mr. Darcy's of the world were enormously wealthy. And when the Industrial Revolution came along and inventors were working out how to create steam engines and railways and, and manufacture in volume and repetitive basis like Henry Ford, the landed gentry could not adapt and their wealth was disintermediated and the new wealthy were the manufacturers. About 150 years after that, you saw the manufacturer's wealth start to disintermediate as you saw the Wall Street equity traders and real estate developers and future traders start taking over and generating enormous wealth. We think that this world of digital assets digital currencies, digital transactions is going to be the next great dis disintermediator of wealth. And that means that it's likely that the existing system is not going to adapt well to it. But guess what, Sage? Generation X, Y and Z are adapting very well to it. And their usage wallets in, a, in, in Australia are sitting at around 25% plus, depending on the age group. They're generating real wealth that they're able to deploy at a future time. So what we're seeing at the moment is we're seeing this double entry account system booking replacement, right? That's what it is. We're seeing that form the foundation of these new industries, these new virtual communities that we call metaverses um, and these new blockchain communities generating tremendous wealth for the investors in it. And that wealth is this next process we believe in disintermediating wealth. And some examples of that is Jamie Dimon's constant state, state statement, you know, Bitcoin is worthless. Well, last time you said it, the market didn't blip because all of a sudden everyone went, who cares? He's irrelevant, let's move on. That's the transfer of a view of where the future is. And, and that is both a generational transfer, but also a technology transfer. And that's why we at Portal Asset Management are, are so excited about being involved with this space and, and, and why you know, we, we, we develop international funds, of which the one you mentioned was just one of three that we have, so that we can give investors deployment across this space and, and engagement in it. Um, and so, you know, excuse me for that pitch, but it's a reality. How do you possibly invest in this space? And really, there's one of three ways to do it. You either buy a token directly, you buy an exchange traded fund, or you invest in a fund. And really that's essentially the three ways to invest in the space. Um, but you know, naturally, I think you probably notice we're fairly bullish on the space age. Absolutely, thank you for putting that all in a nutshell for us, very succinctly. Um, and 
Mark Cuban recently was saying that Bitcoin's value is whatever people will pay for it. So um, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that. Uh, the value of Bitcoin, this peer-to-peer -peer cash system, it's very difficult to decipher exactly where its value comes from. Just off the cuff, do you have any insights to share on that? Yes. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting. So when, when someone says that, you know, heaven forbid, why would I invest in something when its value is only um, is only based on demand and supply. And Jamie Dimon said that. I was aghast. All value is based on demand and supply. Everything is based on demand and supply is the price. That's simple economics. Um, so that's a first fundamental. But the second thing is you may look at this. When you analyze the way the big superannuation funds of this world invest their money, a certain percentage of it goes into bonds. And the bond market these days just you know, obviously with virtually negative or very low interest rates is returning very poor performance and, and really doesn't provide what used to be the balance into a, um, uh, a portfolio that it might once have done. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look at that and say, well, and this is done by Kathy Woods at ARK uh, Investments, they calculated that if 3% of the money that's put into the bond market was to be put into Bitcoin, the estimated price of Bitcoin would be about half a million US dollars. So there is an example of what happens when demand and supply is there. Remember Bitcoin, ultimately 21 million tokens, no more, and that's it. Can't be suddenly, there's no quantum easing with Bitcoin. And then at the same time, if you suddenly think, well, what about the cash reserves of large public companies? And, and it sits in the trillions of dollars. Um, what if 3% of that was put into Bitcoin? And that is also calculated by ARK. And that was around 400,000 US dollars. So you can see as the, economic, as the economic structures of the world change and Bitcoin becomes more relevant in being ways of storing wealth, then this, um, this release of money from traditional environments could add those sort of values to Bitcoin. And so I think that's a lot of why um, more and more institutional investors are investing into Bitcoin, because they see it as becoming a standard addition to their future portfolios. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yes, I think uh, it's proving to be quite as good a hedge against inflation as gold has been in the past, maybe even better depending on, on who you speak to. Um, but another interesting um, sentence that Mark Cuban said was that the inherent value of gold is just the fact that people like the precious gold metal and enjoy wearing it and that is what gives it the value and I guess that's kind of what you're saying about Bitcoin's value and where it's generated from it's just people seeing it on a widespread um, geographies they see the value of it would, would you would you agree so there's so many factors that that um, that influence that part of its generational and I've heard um, I've heard Gen X um, you know, crypto investors refer to gold as boomer rocks. In other words, it's the baby boomers rock. They love it. We don't care about it. We're invested in digital assets. Well, I don't know whether you want to give that a value judgment of yes or no, or that's right or wrong. It just is a generation's coming that hasn't had the same investment view of gold. And the other aspect that's worth considering with gold is that as Bitcoin might become worth $100,000 or $500,000 in the future, there's still 21 million of them and that's it. With gold, if it became worth $100,000 an ounce, you'd be sucking it out of the ocean water and processing it. There is actually unlimited gold available in this world. It all depends on the price of how much it costs to get. So these balances are a part of what I think we'll see generational change of attitude um, and an availability of resources is going to determine um, future gold value. We personally believe that there'll be what we call a flippening. And that is that within a number of years, maybe it's five years, we might see uh, Bitcoin's value at $5 trillion. Well, it's at $1.2 trillion now, so it's not hard to believe that. Well, if it's at $5 trillion, that's about 50% 
of the value of all of the gold that's um, estimated in the world. Well, what happens when it gets to seven and a half trillion dollars and demand for gold drops? Gold might only then be used for jewellery, which in actual fact is a very small percentage of its use. Um, so it has quite an impact, this philosophy or concept of digital assets on the real world. And, and a lot of that impact is due to um, a younger generation coming and their views on it, I think, Sage. Yes, well, I, don't, I don't think you're wrong there at all. And it'll be very interesting to see that the distribution or redistribution of wealth and how it can be impacted through this peer-to-peer -peer cash system, as Bitcoin's white paper says, instead of war. Historically, the main redistribution of wealth and power has been yes. put into effect by war in most cases. Yes, that's a very good statement, Sage, because um, there, there doesn't need to be that sort of disintermediation. And the reason why is because this space is borderless. It's high speed, borderless and efficient. That's the reason why the conversation this morning with India was so relevant. Um, you know, that's, that's a population that is, that's, you know, one in a bit billion people. Uh, they're able to adapt. They're able to start providing services and they're able to transact instantaneously um, without restrictions all around the world. Well, that democratizes wealth. And, and I think we'll see a great deal of that um, progress around the world. And it's interesting to note that the, the, invent, the investors in this space, and by the way, they've invested about $18 billion in venture capital money in the last six months, um, are developed countries with a D on the end. So the Americas and, and Europe and the UK and, and Singapore and South Korea are the investors. The users of this space already are the developing countries. So if you look at the top, there's 156 countries. If you look at the top 20 countries that have been analyzed, the number one country in the world is Vietnam. And then there's the Philippines. And then there's, um, then it, it, it drops down to Cambodia, et cetera, and it drops down to Afghanistan at number 20. And sitting in the middle is China and, and, um, and the USA. So in other words, it's actually dominated by developing countries because they see they see the adoption of this mm. as something they can do immediately because their institutions and infrastructure aren't stopping them to the same level. And I think that will help with the concept of, of world peace and the, 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 the reduction of need to be able to invade countries to be able to generate wealth. Um, it will distribute wealth. And so how people look at to invest in this space should also be different. They don't need to look for a token that's developed into Australia. They don't need to look for a business model or tokenomics, as it's called, to generate income that is some localized product. They can look at an Indian product and go, that's an enormous market and I think India will love it and I want to invest in that utility token. And, and that's democratization from both sides of, of the developed and developing world too. Thanks, Derek. Um, and do you think that people who invest in cryptocurrencies need to be fearful of the internet ever going down or, or cyber warfare? I've heard that cryptocurrency can exist on the blockchain without the internet. Is that true? No, I mean, the internet has to be in existence in some form or other, because that's how transactions are done. So, so I, I don't think anyone's fearing the internet dropping down. Um, I, I think the greatest fear for investment in, um, in digital assets and cyber currencies uh, and this space is regulation, in fact. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, um, a libertarian by any means, and I also believe that people should pay tax on the profits that they generate from this industry. And that's easily done when it's operated through Australian exchanges, etc. cetera. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, regulation needs to be in place to enable the big institutions to start investing in it with confidence. But it mustn't be in place to a level where it throttles back the creativity of developing um, developing digital assets. So to give you an example, the SEC, the head of the SEC in America, a fellow called Gary Gensler, um, is regularly attacking various uh, to centralized token ownership groups. So let's say coin uh, base, which is a big exchange, uh, and they're putting lawsuits against them because they're claiming that uh, they are releasing uh, securities um, according to the, and get this, according to the 1934 Securities Act. Well, Sage, 
it's not the 1934 Securities Act that is the right act for this type of technology to be developed under. So what we fear is that um, is that countries won't ad adapt their existing regulations efficiently and effectively to be able to um, see this industry blossom, yet still get what they should get, which is tax and other things so that the infrastructure of their country progresses. And so our fear are knee-jerk reactions from um, uh, archaic uh, regulatory systems, um, and, and that's a possibility. And when that happens, you'll see the, the value of cryptocurrencies drop dramatically, remember it's volatile, and rise again at the same time because it tends to do this. It'll take a reaction and then it'll recover. But we think uh, regulation represents a, a solid risk to it. However, ironically, it also represents its greatest upside because that, as it ultimately gets um, uh, appropriately regulated, then you'll see very large superannuation countries, companies, st start to be able to deploy their investment into this space because right now they can't. Right now, they're sitting along the edge, sort of poking at it, amazed about it, but they can't deploy money into it because it's not regulated to a level they need. And by the way, it's not large enough for them. At $2.9 trillion, believe it or not, in many cases, to be able to deploy you know, multiple billions of dollars into various aspects of it is not quite ready in many cases. Um, so for the investors that are sophisticated investors and the SMAP family office and the small institution, this is in actual fact a wonderful time to invest because there's this beautiful barrier to entry that sits in place. The giants that tend to take margins out of things and tend to, tend to change the dynamics of the market aren't entering yet, but we expect them here in due course. Yes, I like the sounds of that, that it's not too late. Um, someone did say it's not too late until Bitcoin reaches maybe even a million dollars uh, in its value. So uh -huh. um, who knows, there's still time for those put, who... We, we do, but we need to put Bitcoin into perspective. We've had a great conversation today talking about Bitcoin. It's one of 12,000 tokens. Um, in, on the 1st of January this year, it represented 73% of the capitalization of the market. Um, last week, it represented 42% of the capitalization of the market. Bitcoin hasn't gone down in value, it's gone up in value. But what's happened is this enormous filling out of the economy that's appeared around it. All these layer one or blockchain technologies that have got tokens, you know, it's like Polkadot and Cardano and, mm -hmm. and Avalanche and, and, and Ethereum. What's getting built upon them? Non-fungible tokens, uh, you know, DeFi or decentralized finance. These are all a digital economy. In fact, really multiple digital economies. Ultimately, as Bitcoin even becomes to the value of gold, it's our view that it will just be that. It'll be gold in the economy, like we have gold in the economy. However, the rest of the economy will continue to grow and Bitcoin will become the relevance of a store of wealth, not the basis of this economy um, or these economies that are growing. So, so we, we see the fact that it's now, you know, 43% of the total capitalization as being a really healthy sign the industry's growing. And yeah, and there's so much more to discuss about the concept of, of these virtually sovereign or digital nations that we're creating in, um, in the form of these distributed ledger technologies or blockchain and what's getting built upon them and, and the communities that are forming around it. Um, look, it might sound foreign, but the fact is that it's not foreign. It's how human beings work. We work using community. And, and so all we're doing here is we're just building communities in the form of distributed ledger technology environments. <laughs> Derek, do you think there's a risk I'll, I'll have of a break with... there, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, do you think there's a risk of saturation though, if every company and every small business is jumping on creating a new token? I mean, like you said, there's already like 4,000, 3,000 altcoins out there. Do you think there's a risk of saturation and yes. that it will lose its value if everyone's got one? Or do you think that's actually going to make it stronger and solidify it? It's kind of a little bit like if you're on a ship looking at Singapore and, and Singapore's an island, the only 100% urbanized country in the world. And you'll see fabulous buildings and you'll see activity and you turn around Sage and you say, I would like to invest in that city. So where are you going to invest? Are you going to invest in the stock exchange? Are you going to invest in the companies on the stock exchange? Are you going to invest in the cafes on the street? Are you going to invest in the, the, the taxis? Are you going to invest in real estate, residential, commercial or industrial? 
You see what I'm getting at? So the tokenization of the globe is not only the tokenization of traditional industries, which enables a great deal of offerings to occur, um, but it's also the tokenization of new business models. And so you will see tokens arrive and there'll be no appetite for them and they'll fall away. You'll see tokens arrive and provide a huge solution and, and, and they're becoming a great deal of value. It's typical of a young industry. There's 12,000 tokens out there. There's really more, but there's 12,000 that are known. Um, and probably of those, there's 1,500 to 2,000 that are kind of relevant. But they do cover many different aspects of an economy. So they can't be thrown into a basket and suggested that, well, you know, Bitcoin's this and, and, and this real estate token's that. They're very different things. And, and, and that's what has to be understood with, with digital assets is there. They, they represent the digitization of everything and on top of that new business models in which case um, more often than not one one digital token rep opportunity is different to another one yeah well that is a very interesting point of concentration just the tokenization and the fractionation of assets and which is a great segue on to our next discussion point it's often said that blockchain enables digitization and fractionation of assets but could this lead to the democratization of assets and if so what does this do to the wealth of the future please Derek well actually that was about the disintermediation of wealth that we spoke about it earlier on that question goes perfectly to it so democratization let's let's talk about this for a minute so you get a digital asset let's just say it's an apple stock and it's valued at two thousand um, dollars you can fractionate that using a digital asset to a value of two dollars and that enables then the democratization of that asset in other words anyone anywhere in the world can own that asset and that means that you're breaking down the silos and the main institutions that own these assets and enabling anybody anywhere in the world at any time to own what they can afford in this particular space. And that, that breakdown in democratization enables a better spread of assets to occur. That's our view. Um, but in addition to that, uh, this new generation that's coming and the new, this new generation of technology and the new generations that are uh, uh, adopting it, that in itself is going to change the way wealth is. And that's why we call that the disintermediation of wealth as we know it. And, and that is an extraordinary um, thing to say. I mean, Sage, you know, since the 1700s, there's been three, three disintermediation of wealth periods. And, uh, and we believe we're, we're in the fourth now. Wow, it's so inspiring because it's actually using imagination at this early stage. I mean, it's about 10 years, maybe just over 10 years since Bitcoin was invented. And we've seen so much happen so far, but it's still at that stage where ideas should really be nurtured instead of shunned. And, and hopefully we'll see the full fruits of what Bitcoin can provide, uh, the full fruitfulness of it this venture. Um, yes. Thanks so much for joining us on Expert Talks today, Derek. Really do appreciate your insights. Was there any final um, thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers? I think the most important thing is to learn. Don't be frightened at this space. It's not going to bite you. Um, <laughs> it's a really fascinating area. Uh, you need to be able to leave your knowledge base behind. It's of no use. Much of it is of no use. I often use the analogy that when I got my solo pilot's license back in 1990 something or other, um, I asked the instructor, how did I go? And, and he said, you're all right. You did it in 12 hours. He said, that's pretty average. And I went, oh, thank you. And I said, can you tell me why that kid did it in eight hours? Oh, yes, he said. He's not looking for the brake, the clutch or the accelerator. And what we do for this industry is we bring to it banking, institution, centralization, that's our mindset and we look at it and then we just sort of shake our head and go, I don't understand how it works. Think communities. These are driven by communities, owned by communities, created by communities, but the communities are global. And then think of what happens when you fractionate an asset and provide liquidity to it. Well, its value tends to be increased when you provide liquidity to assets. So my final words are that that you know, this space of course is young, it's volatile, for not a moment am I suggesting one must go and invest in it because we're not here to give financial advice. I'm just saying this is an area that's fascinating. If you're a professional investor with a portfolio, you probably really need to look at this area and work out how you can be a part of this 
digital future um, and, and not, maybe not be a part of, 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 the, uh, of the landed gentry in the 17th century. Um, there really is an opportunity to, to be in both cases in this. It's just a matter of learning and understanding. That's so true and hopefully it will be a breath of fresh air for more and more investors as they learn more about it. Um, and what's so interesting, as you say, is that the more you know, the more you realise that it is opening up questions for so much more that, that is interesting and exciting in the space. It's very fascinating. Yes. Thanks so much again, Derek, yeah. for joining us in, amidst your busy schedule. You're most welcome, Sage. I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk about uh, the, the revolution that is these digital assets, and which is far more than Bitcoin, as we discussed today. Thank you very much, Sage. Thank you again. And viewers, we just had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Derek Graham, the CEO and founder of Portal Asset Management. Please check out the full recorded interview if you've just joined us on YouTube via Calkine Media's channel. Keep watching Calkine for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.